Good afternoon, AI woman who says recording in progress. I do not know if that's audible on the playback later, but a very nice artificial intelligence woman says recording in progress. And I appreciate her very, very, very much. Today's lecture, we're starting week six of Catholicism and Disasters. If you got the flock note, we're talking about the Great Idaho Fire of 1910 and the Messina earthquake of 1908. As I mentioned before I started the recording, the Titanic on Wednesday. So kind of like normal, I'm just gonna go grab my coffee from downstairs, but start. it should be a pretty tidy lecture today. Um, T-I-D-Y, which actually N as well, tiny too. It's probably gonna be pretty compact. So I'll be right back. Thanks for all for being here. Mm -hmm. Two seconds. Can you just squeeze this out? Because these shoes are very sweet. Does anyone watch uh, Pints with Aquinas? Uh, no. There's a recent episode on with a guy named Alan Harrelson, who I highly recommend. Uh, he is a his YouTube channel is called Pipe Cottage. He's from southeastern Kentucky. Him and I were graduate school buddies. We were um, went to graduate school at Mississippi State at the same time, 2010 to 15. He was nominated for a Grammy Award as a banjo player playing with Allison Krauss. Mm -hmm. I am dead serious. And a very interesting thing about him, you think about the opposite. Someone would go to grad school, law school, medical school, whatever, after they're done, like playing music. Like, oh, well, I tried to be the next Mick Jagger, but but he was, he was the opposite. Like, he had a lot of success as a banjo player and he's really wanted to be a historian. Very cool guy, awesome guy. When I knew him, he was uh, he was um, I guess he said well, the whole interview I learned more or less yesterday. I thought I just always assumed he was kind of non-denominational Christian, perhaps Episcopalian. He comes from a Pentecostal background, but he converted to Catholicism. And Matt Fred asks him, and I'm not surprised by that at all. He's always super, super traditional. He still is a very traditional guy. Lives on a farmstead in Kentucky, and you know. Um, smokes pipes, plays banjo, has horses, all that kind of stuff, doesn't lose wife. So I'm not surprised someone who's interested just in conservatism at large and is an intellectual would come to the faith. But Matt Fratt asked him about his kind of conversion journey, and he said about three three months ago, it became a viable option for him very recently. And what led him to the faith was going to the primary sources and reading stuff like Aquinas, Church Fathers, mm -hmm. and he read the catechism front to, front to back. So it was a very, very good interview. It's worth watching. Um, Pints with Aquinas YouTube channel, Errol, Alan Harrelson. It came out like three days ago. Clay Zimmerman, props to Clay, a sometime attendee of this class, um, sent me the link. He said he saw him on there. So it was very, very cool. Um, let's start with Idaho Fire because I'm gonna, we're actually going to go back in time two years. Uh, Idaho Fire of 1810, and then we're going to go back to 1908, Messina earthquake, and, and be done. And remember, on come Wednesday, we're going to be talking about what I would say is probably our most famous disaster uh, to date. I would say it's even more famous than the Black Plague. On Wednesday, we talk about Titanic. I think Titanic is, is even more famous, is even more famous than, than Black Plague. Titanic probably is the most famous one we'll cover the whole semester. I argue in terms of disasters. I mean, I think it's more famous than the Hindenburg. Probably more people, maybe this is sad, know more about the Titanic than the First World War. Atomic bombs, well, that's kind of just like a, you know, 
it happens, you know, one day like the Titanic, but Titanic seems to be more, I don't know, 9-11, what's more famous, 9-11 or Titanic? Maybe at that point we're kind of in competition. Barb, what do you think? Okay. Depends on who you talk to, what your interests are. Fair enough. Does anyone know anything about the Great Fire of 1910? This is perhaps, if I'm not mistaken, our first very local disaster in this class. Last week, we talked about the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. Does that count for us being close? Sure, it's Western US. The class a week ago was Galveston hurricane. Texas is Midwest, kind of, you know, but this is like, this is us, this is Idaho. Anyone know anything about the great Idaho fire of 1910? No, it was oh, great, it was big. Yeah. Uh, it was, um, let's see, there's the, uh, I think some I'm trying to think. There's the Pulaski Tunnel, which is uh, south of Wallace, where this firefighter Pulaski hit hit a mine and left which left his crew and saved dozens of men's lives. Really? Wow. I think that was 1910. Okay. The fire of 1910. Uh, my sister in law worked with the firefighter. That's very a cool. Lot of different, apparently a lot of groups to it. What a beautiful legacy for that guy to be a hero in the moment and then bequeath his name. Betsy Johnson has double confirmation for us. So Betsy Johnson is online. Hello, Betsy. And she says, Betsy read my mind. Betsy and I have ESP. Betsy and I are actually, I've mentioned before, Betsy and I are, are brother and sister or actually related. So we have the special DNA, Betsy and I can read each other's minds. And so she did read my mind and then she put, hello. And then she put um, the answer in the chat. And Betsy said, I have read the big burn. And so Vivian and everyone interested, our first, you've come at the perfect time. The first disaster we're talking about today is great fire in Idaho, 1910. I highly recommend read the book, The Big Burn by Timothy Egan, E-G-A-N. I read a book by him. I have not read The Big Burn, despite having it at home. Isn't that crazy? I have The Big Burn at home. I think my brother, who is Ryan Alexander's age, they're both 1997 birthday people. My brother-in-law bought um, The Big Burn. He has it in our house. I have not yet read it. I read a book by Timothy Egan on the Dust Bowl. He wrote a very good book on the Dust Bowl. But then Betsy, that was her first confirmation that reading my mind, saying, hey, read The Big Burn to get more information about this disaster. But she is confirming the tool that Ryan Alexander uh, mentioned is named after this, after this man. And Betsy writes, I'm gonna read verbatim here. Yes, read it, exclamation point. I've checked it out from the library when I read it, period. So Betsy used two forms of punctuation as well. It's very cool. Great fire of 1910, also known as the big blow off, the big burn was a wildfire in the inland Northwest. Burned 3 million acres. I don't know anything about real estate. I think 3 million acres is a lot. I mean, I think like this, the Augies, this property here is at least a million acres, right? Um, no, right? And three million acres is enormous. Three million acres is absolutely enormous. It is 4,700 square miles. Does anyone know um, how many square miles Idaho is? Can someone look that up? What is the square mileage of the state of Idaho? Betsy Johnson, since you seem to be the, the tech person today, if you could though, Vivian might beat you to it. We'll see. Look up what is what is the square mileage of Idaho? This uh, 1910 Great Fire burns 4,700 square miles. Let's get a state comparison. Betsy writes, and Betsy, I'm not even kidding. Like, you know, my respect for you is through the roof. I mean this when I say it, not like, haha. please keep, please keep um, posting. Um, this is awesome to have this kind of live feed interaction. So please keep posting the entire time. Betsy writes, Pinky Adair from the McConnell Mansion in Moscow is featured in the book, The Big Burn. And Betsy has confirmed, perhaps you have it as well, would be in 83,642 square miles. So still, okay, um, 5,000 compared to 80,000. That's still 1 16th of the entire state. I mean, this is an enormous, enormous fire. And uh, I have a note here in terms of state comparisons. It is approximately the size of the entire state of Connecticut. Okay. The area includes large parts of the Bitterroot, Clearwater, Coeur d'Alene, Flathead, Kootenai, Lewis and Clark, Lolo, and St. Joseph National Forests. It burns just for two days on the weekend of August 20th and 21st, 1910, just two days. But remember, what's been interesting to me in this Catholicism and disasters class is looking at the kind of statistics of disasters. 
You talked about earthquakes when they shake for 45 seconds. That's a long time. My initial thought is, you know, well, that's not that bad. I mean, it wasn't, again, stupid me kind of in pure ignorance would think, oh, a devastating earthquake shake for like six or seven hours. No. I mean, it's a violent event. How long did the Hiroshima bomb shake for? Two seconds when it exploded and then the entire city's level? Betsy writes, so so two days of burning for a forest fire this size, the size of Connecticut, despite Betsy saying correctly, Connecticut is pretty small. Quote, Betsy Johnson, true. Connecticut is pretty small. It's still a very, very impressive fire. And I use impressive in the, the, the actual definition. I mean, it is awe-inspiring. It's crazy. Um, the big problem here, a numerous small fires combined into kind of a fire tornado. Betsy, you're breaking up. Can you speak again? Oh, sorry. I was talking to myself and forgot I was muted. Never mute yourself. If you mute I yourself, wasn't muted. Sorry. I'm not muted, but I meant to be muted. Class. I'm turning off Zoom. If you oh you did it. I'm gonna I'm gonna cancel the class. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw my computer out the window. Um, these winds these, cause these smaller fires to be whipped up into a larger conflagration. They got rest their souls. 87 people, most of them firefighters, are killed in these blazes. Why is it mostly firefighters? A lot of this is a very rural area. If you drive out to Wallace today, I drove on um, I drove on uh, US 12 recently. Ever, anyone ever go to um, Jerry Johnson Hot Springs? Anyone ever be there? Hey. It's close to Montana. It's very close to Lolo Pass. Have you been? Close. Okay. Bless you. If you drive on US 12 um, out, you know, past Orofino, right, and you're going towards Lolo Pass, 12 will eventually take you to the junction into Montana, as you said, through Lolo Pass to 93, where if you go right on 93, you're going to go south to more Montana and eventually like, like Hamilton, Montana, you eventually end up like in Sun Valley. And if you go north when you get off 12, 93, it's like 20 minutes to Missoula, Montana. On mile marker 152, about 20 miles before you arrive in Montana, there's Jerry Johnson hike and hot springs. I recommend it highly. I've probably made this point a thousand times. I actually did a, a HIPAA lecture in 2020 called Idaho Hot Springs, um, Heaven on Earth, or something like that. Like, I, I love hot springs. I, I love hot tubs, too. The idea of like being a human being soaking in hot water appeals to me. How can I put it like catch all, like anything? If there's some weird Finnish guy, he's like, I made a hole in the ground. It's got 110 degree water. Do you want to get in? I'm like, I'm in. I'm definitely in. Um, this Jerry Johnson hot spring is super cool. Mile marker 152. You walk for about a mile. And these naturally occurring, you know, geyser water pools, right? Naturally occurring from, from, the, from the ground and it mixes with the cold river water. Why am I making this point? What is the point of this? The point is that today, today, this region where this fire is, is very desolate. There's still nobody there. So the reason that of the 87 people killed, mostly are firefighters is no one is there. Maybe that's a positive benefit. It's not, you know, it's not the great Chicago fire. It's not the fire in Galveston after the hurricane hits, um, or excuse me, San Francisco. You can compare it. I want you always compare and contrast in disasters. This is the opposite of what we saw last week, where there's a fire, there's a, there's a devastation, a highly densely populated city, and everyone dies because things start coming down. And that's what we're going to talk about in about five minutes with Messina. But here it's still very, very rural. It is believed to be the largest, although not deadliest, forest fire in U.S. history. Um, in the aftermath, the U.S. Forest Service receives considerable recognition for its firefighting efforts, including... Here's many where it's like, you know, where the saying comes, put your money where your mouth is. Congress doubles its budget. Congress approves a, a doubling of the, of the budget for the Forest Service. And perhaps most famously for kind of impacts, this is one of the first times in American history you start talking about, thank you for your service, firefighters. Not just the kind of that cliche saying towards the brave men and women who, you know, fight overseas, fight as in the army, in the Navy, in the, in the armed forces. The idea of the firefighter as an ultimate public servant. Prior to this, the firefighter is kind of like, you're the firefighter. Hey, your house is on fire. You're you're going to be a firefighter to, to stop the blaze, right? It's this kind of professionalization of the noble vocation of the firefighter. So I'm responding to even in the middle of nowhere um, to you know just save wilderness for its own sake. Save towns because people are going to come back after they've, you know, perhaps they're evacuated as the you know, oncoming fire. Firefighters as heroes. 
And it also, final if point number three, number one is doubling the budget. Number two is recognizing firefighters as public servant heroes. Number three is the Great Idaho Fire of 1910 does a lot towards fire prevention in subsequent years. And we can say the same thing for Galveston. 10 years earlier, last week, about hurricane prevention. How about seismology and building buildings to withstand um, earthquakes in the San Andreas Fault with San Francisco? So it's nice how, obviously, I structured the timeline of this course to have things move in a linear fashion for that purpose. We can see where these things build off one another. In Idaho, one third, 33% of the town of Wallace was burned to the ground. Mm -hmm. I was in Wallace as well, not recently, um, a year ago. It's still in the middle of nowhere. Wallace, has anyone been to Wallace before? It's very, very beautiful. Wallace is very cool, very nice kind of historical town. Um, I actually watched, you guys are not going to believe this. Vivian, you're going to think I'm joking, but I'm dead serious. I watched the Buffalo Bills play the Miami Dolphins in the AFC playoffs in Wallace last year with a bunch of local Wallace people, and they were rooting for the Bills, like me. So it was good. We became friends that day. One third of the of Wallace burned to the ground. The Bills won, by the way, in case you're wondering. They won, but they lost the Cincinnati Bengals the next week, unfortunately. Also, Josh Allen, who's the Bills quarterback. Josh Allen invited me. It, no, no, no. So I'm not joking at all. I'm an idiot slash I just I misspoke. The game was on TV. I was watching it at, at, at a bar in Wallace. Yeah, yeah. The, the game was the game was in Buffalo, New York. It was on like eight uh, on on NBC. So I'm not joking. I was watching the Buffalo Bills play the Miami Dolphins in Wallace, but but on a TV. Okay. Yeah. So no. So I'm not even lying. Like you are you you are and were correct the entire time. I just misspoke. Okay. I did not mean to make a joke. Like yeah, two NFL teams had come. No, 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 no. I, I watched. I just. We were passing through on the way <laughs> and it was like, get a cup of coffee and the game's on. We stayed for like an hour to watch this game right. where normally I would on a trip back from or coming back from Missoula actually would have just kept watching on my phone or wait till I got home would not have, you know, stopped, yeah. especially one third of the town of Wallace is burned to the ground and estimated $1 million in damage today. That would be $31.4 million. It's insane. You know, nothing compares to the human tragedy, but the property damage matters too. Recently, um, our basement flooded in real life, like two weeks ago, and a little bit. Thank God, on a scale of zero to one hundred, it was zero point five. It was nothing. It was nothing. Got a bunch of rags, spent a couple, you know, hours cleaning up. No big deal. I can't imagine, you know, oh, it's no big deal. Oh, well, you survived. Oh, my, everything burned to the ground. This is awful to you, right? This is not. Obviously, life is number one. But if if your entire town burns down, you lose all your house, maybe this homestead you spent years building. That's that sucks, right? That, I, I would never like. That's not oh, you know. So again, remember, like th thankfully the, the the loss of life is is mitigated. Turner, hello. The light the loss of life is mitigated. However, it's the property damage is pretty significant. Passenger trains evacuated thousands of Wallace residents to Spokane and Missoula. Another train with a thousand people from Avery took refuge in a tunnel after racing across the burning trestle. Other towns severe, severely damaged in Idaho area. Most famous probably Kellogg. Kellogg is in that area. Here's crazy though. Turner, we're finishing up um, the Great Idaho Fire of 1910. Hello, Mauricio. Hey, Ross. Mauricio, are you for real in the club right now? This is amazing, man. I cannot believe you're here. This makes me so happy. Guys, this is awesome. It's awesome. You know what? I, I People, Mauricio won't tell you. Turner won't tell you. I pay people today to walk in every three minutes. So by, <laughs> by the end of class, by the end of class, there's going to be 6,000 people in here. Yeah, no. more welcome guys i'm serious it's, it's seriously so good to see you. i love you guys all you're the best seriously thank you for being here um i will get back to business but i always say like i have done we had that one off day with labor day i think it was i, I was in here by myself and i just recorded a video online and because i was by myself i did half of it in french and if you don't believe me i'm dead serious you can go back to maple syrup history none of you watch it i see the views on that channel <laughs> you guys can go back and watch it half of that episode is in french and I make up this story about I'm doing it for my Canadian viewers in, in, in Montreal. I am, I swear I'm being serious. If you don't believe me, you can check it out later. But so anyways, so I, I have fun regardless, but it's really, really good to have people here. It's awesome. So th thank you for, there are so many other things you could be doing in your, in your nods. I, I, I know it's just, well, actually, no, you're, you're actually right. You've called me on two things today and been right both times. Before you guys came in, I was talking about, we're finishing our first disaster. It actually come at the right time because 
uh, our main star today is the 1908 Messina earthquake. We're just finishing up the 1910 uh, Idaho fire. And I said that last year, and this was true, I watched the Buffalo Bills and the Miami Dolphins play the a AFC playoff game in, in Wallace. And Barb's like, wait a second, why, were, why was there an NFL game in Wallace? And I had to specify, thank you for the clarification, that uh, we were watching on TV. And um, the what, what, was, what, what was the thing we were talking about right now? I totally lost my train of thought. The second thing, you just said the second point about something. Well, I assume that meant you some That's it, thank you. So for that episode, you're exactly right. I reported that on September 1st. Labor Day was the fourth, it was four Labor Day. So I, I've misspoken again, that was exactly what I was trying to say. But but you can but, but again there's proof I did I, half the episode is in French if anyone wants to see that if anyone's like I'm a French speaker I love French I'm gonna go then go back and watch that. Here's the last point. What did you all miss in the Great Fire of Idaho? Did you all cut up? 1910 in the middle of nowhere. Congress doubles the budget of the Forest Service, saying, "Hey, props to you guys." The public says firefighters are heroes. It's the it's the uh, largest fire in U.S. history. Burns the size of Connecticut. Uh, 4.4, 4, what is it? 4.7, let me see. Um, yeah, 4,700 square miles, size of Connecticut. Only 87 people die, but it's $31.4 million of damage, just in Wallace. And um, out of this comes this recognition, this ultimate recognition that we'll really see in, in, in kind of full throttle 91 years in the future, we talk about 9-11 with kind of firefighters as the ultimate kind of public heroes and servants. Here's the last point on the, the Idaho fire. The smoke went, the smoke from the fire went as far east as New York City and as far south as Dallas, Texas. So very, very impressive fire. Remember, once more, it is not the, um, it is not the deadliest fire in U.S. history. It is the largest. It burns the most amount of acreage in u.s history okay so that that was kind of an added bonus kind of like one time we talked about you know during the cholera pandemic made brief mention upon uh the irish potato famine this is the main story that we're going to talk about today the 1908 messina earthquake because anyone know anything about this so again you all have come i'm dead serious at the perfect time because i was kind of you know cherry on top this is this is the main course what is the 1908 messina earthquake Well, it's your lucky day because I have info on all that. It is, it happens uh, December 28th, December 28th, 1908. It is a 7.1 on the Richter scale. Talked about San Francisco last week, which was only two years prior, even though, you know, all the way across the world. Messina is 7.1. San Francisco was 7.9 on the Richter scale. Between 75,000 and 82,000 people are killed, mainly in the cities of, from which the earthquake takes its name, Messina, Italy, and Reggio Calabria. Messino and Reggio Calabria, I think Southern Italy, Sicily. 7.1 on the Richter scale, between 75 and 82,000 people killed. It is the most destructive earthquake to ever strike Europe. What are some causes of this? Hmm. Ancient buildings, no building for this. Well, see, that's brilliant on your part, and you're exactly correct. Um, that's not the only point. Like that's that's not the kind of immediate cause. And we'll talk about the immediate cause, the the kind of thing that initiates it. But you're exactly right. Think of the opposite to what we just talked about with Great Idaho Fire. Only 87 people are killed because no one lives. In northern Idaho. Before you all came in, I was telling a story about be recently visiting a hot spring, Jerry Johnson, US Road 12, out towards Lolo Pass, Montana. I said, even today, 2023, nobody is out there. No one is out there. There's no houses, nothing. It's just forest. Messina is very densely populated. And all these cities are completely, you know, they're, they're centuries old, some of them. Some of these cities date back to the 11th, 12th, 13th century. This is why Messina, in the wake of this tragedy, would be called the city without a memory, or basically the city. Maybe the better translation would be the city whose identity was stolen. I mean, it's completely just completely derased to nothing, to, to, to the ground. It, exactly. And Barb, I, I love how your mind works. I'm serious. This amazing point. The firebombing of Dresden in the Second World War has a similar, okay, down to the nuts and bolts, down to the studs, down to the clean slate, 
Well, look how different the causing agent is. Here it's Mother Nature. There it's you know Allied bombs. We're going to talk about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? How do you compare Hiroshima and Nagasaki or Dresden and some of the evaporated, eliminated, annihilated cities of the Second World War with things that are naturally occurring? Italy sits along the boundary zone of the African continental plate. And this plate is pushing against the seafloor underneath Europe at a rate of one inch per year. My knowledge of geology is like if you ask me to speak Chinese right now. I don't know a single word in Chinese. I'm not that serious. You know? Like I think even like um konichiwa is a Japanese word that means something. I don't even know a single freaking Chinese word. So that's what I know about geology, about sub plate tectonic underwater. I have no idea if that's a lot. I think that's probably significant. If the plate is pushing against the sea at a rate of one inch per year, I think in terms of where we talk about like geological epochs and like, well, these dinosaurs went extinct over the course of, you know, 19 million years. And it's like, we're talking about 19 million year periods in the course of a billion years, as we talk about say like the 1970s, one inch doesn't seem, I think that's a lot for tectonic force, but someone can, can, you know, correct me. I don't know if it's, I don't know how to phrase it in why, but yet it is an average typically. So it's all those global earthquakes that measure, that measure that distance. And when it means subtectonic, it means the African plate is going under the European plate or whatever the name of the plate is, it's European, which is what's forking the Alps up and causing all that volcanic activity along southern Italy and some Greece, I think. Okay. And, uh, but about an inch per year means that that's kind of on average. So there might be years where there's no significant. Right. Or then, a quarter of an inch. And then it builds up tension. And then when it that tension rips and there's this huge shift in movement over a very short period of time. That's when the earthquakes happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, sound, that sounds good to me. Thank you. Yeah. That seems to make sense. Um, the earthquake was recorded by 110 seismographic stations around the world. One of the first to be recorded in such fashion. Next week, we're going to talk about, if I'm not mistaken already, by the way, before I forget, I'll probably mention again, but on Wednesday is our, it's time to go nuts class. It's Titanic. Titanic is on Wednesday, I know, right? It's going to be so sick. And your, your reaction is exactly how I feel. We're going to go insane. We're going to go nuts on every little detail. Like so far, I would say out of scale, zero to 10, every class you're going to keep in the nines, 9.3, 9.4, really good quality, I hope, God willing. And, and the quality comes from you more than anyone else in your comments. Titanic, we're going to go 14. Every last three. I'm, I'll, I'm only regretting I haven't given a whole week to the Titanic. But such is life. Um. But but next week, Artie, we'll talk about the First World War and Spanish flu. We do do two classes on that. I believe the world First World War is the end of the Middle Ages. It is the true start of modernity, that lost generation after um, in the 1920s that Hemingway talked about. So, so a lot of things, a lot of technological innovations come from the 1890s, 80s, 1900s. Look at the World Fair. Like I always use the example of the 1904 World Fair in St. Louis. They're trying to do what would amount to wireless internet. At the 1904 St. Louis Fair, they're having wireless telegraph towers. Like, hey, we've mastered the telegraph. We do it through the air. So the idea that like, oh, you know, the, the seismology, the sensitive instruments are able to record this. It's, it's 1908. It, it's last week. You know, it's, it's a very modern time. But your earlier best comment of the day so far about how Messina is this very old city will lead to this travesty in the kind of collapsing in, the opposite of what we see in Idaho. So much fire burning in forest, but no one's there. Here, even the smallest push leads to massive caving in and all that kind of thing. The Strait of Messina is part of the regional tectonic feature known as the Calabrian Arc. Some of the strongest earthquakes in the last 150 years have occurred in this region. And like Mount St. Helens, Russian, are we going to talk about Mount St. Helens in this class? How can we not? Of course we are. Um, when we talk about Mount St. Helens in a month, maybe you're, of course, it's 1980, so it's towards the end of the semester. I think we talk about Mount St. Helens right before we talk about Chernobyl. Um, Mount St. Helens erupts on May 18th, 1980, but there's significant activity in February, March, or even like March 27th, two months beforehand. Same thing here. This earthquake happens on December 28th, but already by November 1st, already almost two months in advance, there's significant seismological clues of what might be coming down the line. Okay, so on Monday, December 28th, 1908, at 520 in the morning, anyone remember when San Francisco earthquake struck? What was the time for that? Very close this time. Exactly, so only eight minutes apart. Another early morning earthquake. 
Monday, December 28th, 1908, 520 in the morning, this happens. It has a depth, the epicenter, about 5.5 miles. I mean, just imagine, it's like hydrogen bombs going off in the ground. Almost 91% of the city structures in Messina are completely destroyed. The city is almost completely destroyed. Your point, I don't know how, if you know how good a point that was about Dresden. It looks like it was firebombed. It looks like it was atomically nuked. It looks like Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the aftermath. 91%. If you have 10 buildings, nine are completely destroyed. And that 10th one got chipped in pretty good. They'll, they'll give a nice 1% and bite of the apple. Like nothing is left unscathed, basically. This is why once more, it leads to this awful, awful death toll of upwards of, you know, three-fourths of 100,000 people, 75 to 80,000 people. San Francisco, the earthquake shook for 45 seconds. This one is 37. However, the damage here is so widespread that destruction is felt throughout square mileage of 1,700, a, a total of 1,700 square miles. 1,700 square miles feel direct, not just aftershocks, in that 30 second, second phase, the immediate kind of explosion, if you will. In Calabria, the ground shakes violently all over, provoking many landslides. In the Calabrian commune of Palmi, which is on the coastline, there is almost a total devastation that kills everyone in the city. Oh, 600 people just completely devastated by landslide, by the shaking event and the rocks falling down the landslide. A young doctor who escaped with his life later recounted that, quote, the profound silence is broken by an extraordinary noise, like the bursting of a thousand bombs, followed by a rushing and torrential rain. And I heard a sinister whistling sound, which was like a thousand red hot irons hissing in the water. That's pretty brutal. Yeah, imagine, do you want to hear what, what, what does a red hot iron feel like in the water? I'll tell you how you can do this. If you're like, I, I'm not near, I can't get to a foundry. I need to experience this. Uh, go home, put a uh, pan on your stove. Do it super, super hot, right? Like a pan that you cook eggs in. And just let it chill there for an hour. Make sure you're monitoring this science experiment, right? Uh, after it gets wicked, wicked hot, take it off and dump cold water on it. And that's what it'll sound like. It may, and by the way, do not do this, right? If you, if you're, if you don't want it to like, scald your face or something. But that sound, anyone who's like, no, anyone's like made eggs or toast or whatever, and like it's still too hot, and dump it on you, like, it's right away kind of thing. So a thousand red hot irons hissing in the water. Other survivors reported there were three separate and different movements. So it's not 37 seconds of continu continuous stuff kind of undulating the 10 seconds, you know, periods of massive explosions. The first is a shaking backwards and forwards. So backwards and forwards, then violently up and down and third moving in a circular motion. That is, that is, that is, hor that is horrifying. Imagine we're in this room right now. And for the first, let's say it's 12 seconds, 12, 12.3 seconds would be exactly 37 seconds divided by three. So the first 12.3 seconds, the room is going to shake back and forth. It's super crazy for 12. That's, that's going to be terrifying. We stop, then immediately it's going up and down. And we're like, we well, can't do anything else. So it's going in a circle. I mean, this is crazy. And I, I mean, firsthand accounts, you have to take with some grain of salt. It's like, are these people traumatized? Like literal PTSD, but okay. Question. Yeah. I think just the, the 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 combined efforts of all the firefighters. I think coming in, I I have no idea how firefighting works beyond like. Um, yeah, I I don't think so. I, I think it was put. I think it was put out. I, I think it was. I think it was. It burned through and was contained. So so what I understand is again, and I'm saying this again. If anyone's listening on the YouTube stream, oh, there's 21,000 people on right now. So someone's got to be a firefighter, those people. So my, I know nothing about firefighting, but you make like a break line or something, right? You know, you set up a kind of perimeter where the fire cannot go back. I think it burned everything in there and the firefighters were able to just con contain and control it. But that the containment effort that was so great, the smoke makes its way, as I said, all the way to New York and Dallas. Mm -hmm. So also our, our pan thing, what happens when you, the red hot iron for the pan, you get massive steam coming off that. So even when this fire is put out, hence like when you put out a campfire, you get massive smoke afterwards. So that that's, but again, I, I recommend, I recommend agreeing with me and Betsy Johnson, who have both said, you know, read the big burn. I, that book is very, very um, regaled. It, it's, it's very famous within like environmental 
history, nature writing. Timothy Egan is a legend in that in that field. Mm -hmm. Do I have a personal like, well, Timothy Egan's the man, the man, the man? No. Like I, I don't, I've read one of his books by the Dust Bowl, whatever. And environmental history is not my forte. I'm just saying within environmental history, what I've heard of Timothy Egan is he writes very, very good kind of like Barnes and Noble books, like well-researched, but they're very exciting. They read like, it's, so, so pick up a copy of The Big Burn. I mean, in fact, I will probably now, um, having just briefly touched on here, probably read it myself. Like I said, I have it at home. Uh, here's what Betsy's typing in here. A pinky adder was a homesteader in the Great Fire of 1910, roared through the mountains along the Idaho-Montana border. She was conscripted to feed the troops and firefighters after she hiked 20, 28 miles in her hobnail boots. That's pretty boss. Um, through the forest fires. Audio on this page is from oral history she recorded on February 24th, 1977. Her sister and Bernadine Cornelson also participated. It's from the Bernard Stockbridge Collection here at the UBI. Betsy, that is deep level archival work. Thank you for that. And once more, courtesy of Betsy Johnson, you can go to the Bernard Stockbridge Collection at the U of I Libraries and read kind of this, well, this one first-hand account, this amazing woman hiked 28 miles. Today, people are like, I don't want to hike. Like, I don't want to go like 100 yards and my feet hurt. She hiked 28 miles to put out a fire. What, a, what an absolute baller. Of course, of course, she lived 67 more years. She was probably super fit. She could hike 28 miles in 1910. It says she also lived to be 201 years old. I'm not surprised. Um, she's still she's still alive now, actually. <laughs> she's actually coming to class in five minutes. So if you like Miss Adar what comes in, if you welcome her with a standing ovation, that'd be very nice. I think I think she'd appreciate that. Oh no, actually she wrote me an email. She said currently in studio working on our rap song. So she's not gonna be here. <laughs> Thank you, Pinky, for, for keeping the quality high. Um okay. Other survivors, well, we talked about the 37, whatever, you know, up and down. Most accounts concur. Remember sideways and up and down and like a, like a whirlpool. Most accounts concur that it was the second upwards motion that caused the widespread destruction of Messina. The company noise described as having been, quote, exactly like that made by a fast train in a tunnel. The elevated death toll was due to the fact that most people were asleep. That was your point in San Francisco, you know, five o'clock in the morning and killed outright or buried alive in their beds as their house, houses collapsed on them. Thousands were trapped in debris, suffering horrific injuries of which many would die. One week before the earthquake, um, 160,000 inhabitants were counted in the entire Messina, uh, Messina commune, and many more had come to see Giuseppe Verde's Opria Idea, uh, Ida, which had been staged um, the previous evening. So it's like, it's a large city, it's an old city, it's early in the morning, you know, again, may, may God rest their souls. Like the, the fact this happened, you know, what, 113 years ago, those people suffered as we would, you know, so tragic and awful to even like consider the, the horror of all that, the exacerbation of the horror because, and perhaps this is one of the things with, with uh, living in a city. We're going to talk about Catholicism and COVID in our last class. I love living in a city. I love living in New York. I love being able to go to get a cup of coffee at two o'clock in the morning and go to a play in the city that never sleeps until COVID comes and I'm forbidden from leaving my apartment kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like pro and con. Like a city has so much to offer, but it's the worst place to be, maybe in a health crisis or a disaster situation. Oh, living in the middle of nowhere, Idaho, man, you're so redneck. You're so hick. You're so back. There's nothing there. You're such a, blah, all the, now that's a, it's the best place to be when World War III starts, mm -hmm. right? When World War III, I want to be in Wallace. You know, uh, whoever the Chinese, the Russians probably be like, it's not worth it. Just let them just leave them alone. <laughs> like they get the maps like Wallace. Nah, no, let's move on. It's like, you know, I mean, there, there's pro and cons. There's pro and cons. And in fact, I will say, I really do love being a, a kind of Pullmanite, Moscowite, just Palouse person. It is so beautiful on the Palouse. And I've mentioned many, many times National Geographic in 1982 called this region a paradise and said it was a top 10 most beautiful region in, on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and that is not sarcasm, I mean dead serious. Top 10 region, not in the PNW or America or North America or the West, the whole world. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to love here. One of the added benefits is, yeah, if there is a natural disaster, God forbid, it's not living one on top of another. Like imagine an earthquake striking Tokyo or Beijing, those massive high, everyone dies, everyone gets buried in, right? So this is a problem here as well. About 10 minutes after the earthquake, the sea on both sides of the strait suddenly withdrew as a 12 meter tsunami swept in. That's a 40 foot tsunami. 40 foot tsunami swept in, three waves struck nearby coasts, impacting hardest along the Calabrian coast and inundating the second city. Remember Messina and Reggio Calabria. 
after the sea had receded back to the shore. The entire Regio seafront was destroyed, and the people who had gathered there, of course, died. Um, Betsy writes, Wallace won't be safe. It is east of Seattle. I don't know, Betsy. People, the, the invaders will show up in Seattle and be like, you know, like Meg Ryan was right. You know, sleepless in Seattle, like Tom Hanks, coffee. We're just going to chill here. We're not going to, to Wallace. And then they'll like, you know, they'll get into like grunge music and they'll be like, I got to go to a thrift store and dress like Kurt Cobain and sit in the basement. They won't they'll be like, we're done. We're done with, with, with warmongering. We're just going to listen to you. It smells like teenage spirit a hundred times. Uh, <laughs> that we're going to learn English that way. That's our English learning. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, neither here nor there. A bunch of other cities are hit as well, besides this relief, Reggio Calabria, in Messina, remember, which is a city 91% destroyed, 80,000 people killed. The tsunami also causes more devastation and deaths. Many of the survivors of the earthquake had fled to the relative safety of the seafront to stop, escape their collapsing host houses, and it becomes the same thing we saw in Lisbon in 1755. I am escaping the 9-11 style north and south tower collapsing on my head in Messina, and I go to the seafront, and then here, this is happening, I'm escaping, and then this happens, 40 feet. It's just, it's complete disaster. It's a complete, it is insane. All right, um, Messina, when all is said and done, lost almost half its population, and the entire historical center was devastated, including its Norman Cathedral, which itself had withstood previous earthquakes, like one in 1783. The Messina shoreline was irrevocably altered. Large sections of the coast had sunk several feet into the sea. Churches, palaces, houses, monuments, commercial, municipal, and public buildings, all of them either collapsed or were so severely damaged they soon do collapse. Um, in terms of famous, uh, famous Italians who die, I feel at this point like I'm reading, um, you know, Dante's Divine Comedy when he talks about all the people in uh, you know, 13th century Florence and 14th century Florence, so we have no idea who they are. But if you know who these people are, Italian sculptor Gregor, uh, Gregorio Zappala, uh, Crescenzo Grillo, Giacomo de Macri, the former rector of the University of Messina, politicians like Nicola Petrina, Nicola Fulci, Giovanni Noe. Again, you're just like, whatever, whatever. And I, I mean, truly, like, again, God rest all their souls. This would much more hit home, like, God forbid there is a disaster in which, you know, we knew who the people were, right? I mean, but like, it is affecting... The, the point of me reading that is affecting the well-off, the not well-off, all, all people. Christ, our blessed Lord, in, you know, of course, true God and true man, therefore, you know, the, the very embodiment of wisdom, I think says it best about that Tower of Siloam thing that I keep coming back to from the Gospels about, do you think you're more righteous than them? Like the tower fell on them, but if you don't repent, the same thing will happen to you. I mean, this isn't like all of us are sinners. Maybe that lesson of the ultimate Catholic reaction we see going back to the black plague lectures we should repent while we have time and not not think we're special all oh, these guys must have related something bad they must have been like a sodom and gomorrah city like we, we're all that all of us are sinners and there but by the grace of god go i that could happen to our city everyone kind of um is dying and damage was heaviest in the old historic center and the low level central and northern sections of the city both due to old buildings and in the latter, the soft sandy soil. So anti Sandreas Fault preparatory work in the buildings, not even fortifications. They're buildings that could be knocked over by, you know, the, the big bad wolf blowing on it too hard. It's just not, these are not cities meant to, you know, withstand this. Yeah. Adding to the horror and terror, families have become separated during this, obviously. And a torrential downpour of rain that had begun only five minutes before the earthquake added to the confusion. That's that's horrifying. And not only the earthquake, the tsunami coming, now it's just like a foggy driving rain where you can't even see two feet. I was driving on the moscow Pullman Highway last year at some point and had that kind of condition where you had to pull over the side of the road. Everyone's been in that, right? It's just like kind of sleety. It doesn't matter how, how fast you put on the windshield wipers. So earthquake, tsunami, everyone dead, everything collapsed, driving rain. Now... These great gas tanks at the northern end of the city blow up. Fire breaks out, caused by these bro broken gas pipes, adding, of course, to the chaos and destruction. And the ground continued to shake with repeated aftershocks, causing remaining structures that had not fallen to fall down on top of the ruins themselves. Okay, enough of that. I mean, I think that's getting gratuitous now. It's like it, we're comparing it to San Francisco, to Lisbon of 17th. It's a typical earthquake. 
everything is destroyed, aftershocks, fire, and in these very this kind of sad extra note when these happen by the ocean, it seems to the sea gets called in from these aftershocks to deluge whatever is remaining with these massive tidal waves. First Catholic reaction. First Catholic reaction. Quote, processions of naked survivors carried pictures of saints appearing in the streets. Okay, so the, the note I made is, this is that immediate reaction. Remember the mathematical formula y'all didn't like? So, you know, one minus one, CAD, something like that. I said, well, you know, one of the reactions is, or the, the three reactions always are, you know, God is punishing us. Well, I don't know if God is punishing us, but it's providential. God is still in charge of this, and that's just natural. It just it happens. Often, though, people who see God's hand in these things say we must be being scourged for our sins. A lot of, quote, unquote, traditional Catholics today will talk about like a great chastisement. You know, and the message of Fatima. By the way, I as a devout, I 100% believe in every part of the message of Fatima. If I see, if if I and I am kind of saying like with chastisements and punishments, like I leave that to God. That's none of my business. I'm not going to go and try to be this fake prophet. I don't know. God have mercy on us. The message of Fatima, 100%. Like thank God for the Church declaring what is to be believed and what is not. I 100% believe in the veracity of the message of Fatima and Our Lady said, if people do not stop defending the Father, a worse war will break out. It happens in the Second World War. Have we stopped offending God today with our society? I think probably not. It's probably worse than ever. I think anyone could, could, could acknowledge that. And if not worse than ever, it's not good. Well, people will often talk about, you know, we're going to be punished. We're going to be punished for our sins. This happens. This is always the Catholic reaction disaster. There must be some divine chastisement at work. Let us repent. So even though I'm completely naked, Shorn of all my goods, I'm carrying pictures of saints as if like as if in sackcloth and ash. Lord have mercy upon me. That's the first Catholic reaction. We have as well, kind of like 9-11, kind of like World War One. Rescue is rescue is searching through the ruins for weeks, uh, but thousands remain buried beneath the rubble. Uh, their bodies never recovered. This happened at the ground zero 9-11. All these poor people, they, their bodies never recovered. This happened in World War One in the mass graves. Well, your your brother's body just disintegrated into the ground because he was in the trench for three years. Uh, we couldn't get him, or he's in no man's land, you know, whatever. So, like, why, this kind of remember Black Plague as well, this desensitization to death. We saw this with Galveston. They had gangs, they organized gangs, groups of people to go and get the bodies and put them in the ocean. They tide wash them back in. They eventually have to start burning people on the beach, like you know, Viking style, fun funeral pyres. Second Catholic reaction. They want to know who the Pope was at that time and what he does. This is so vast. It's one set. Remember, I'm going to give you three kind of main Catholic reactions. They were done with the staff. Talking about the first thing is the people themselves. They're not just trying to attending to the the survivors. Are some of them doing penance, proceeding uh, with carrying pictures of saints, doing reparation? Lord have mercy on us. We must be being scourged. God, God forgive us. That's reaction number one. Okay, we talked about that. What is who is the Pope at that time? What does he do? This is 1908. Pope, Pope Saint Pius X, defender of the church against modernism. And, you know, yeah, very charitable. Yeah, I, I like him a lot too. Um, exactly, Pope Saint Pius X. Um, Pius the Ninth is eighteen forty six to seventy eight, but, but he's he's the previous he's the previous um, one. So your guess is like is approximately like a, he's the next Pius. But he's Pius X. Pius X, we'll talk about him next week too, because he dies when the First World War breaks out. He He's the one he succeeds. He's not Leo the Great, but we might call him Leo the Second Great, Leo the Thirteenth, Rerum Novarum. Pope Leo the Thirteenth is Pope from 1878 to 1903. Pius X succeeds him. And I'm going to give you a little bit of his biographies, right? So, so eloquently put it, it's true. He's seen as this amazing, amazing kind of bulwark Pope standing up against the modern world, even if it's like spitting into the wind. Won't this old curmudgeon guy get with the times? And he just like holds up a flashing neon sign based, based, based. <laughs> Every decision is like super, super old school. Uh, 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 you know, kind of, well, I'm trying to look for the right descriptive word. A passionate defender uh, of the tradition of Holy Mother Church, Pope St. Pius X. But we're going to talk about why this is so disgusting today. In the modern church today, we seem to see this thing. This is the ultimate point I want to make about today's lecture. We seem to see this point, which is fallacious, that I can either be rigid and traditional 
but then I'm not compassionate. I hate the poor. I, I'm not sympathetic. Or I can be sympathetic to others, but that means I'm a total heretic. I just say, you can do whatever you want. Sin isn't real, right? We see this kind of fallacious, disgusting bifurcation heresy in our church today. You have to pick one side. Are you compassionate or are you conservative? If you're conservative, you care about the tradition. Obviously, you hate everyone. You're a bigot. Like, and if you're compassionate, well, that's great, but you're then you're a heretic. No. Pius is a guy who is super rigid, like six-pack abs level, 0% fat, Catholic doctrine, no compromise. And yet he what he does in relation to this, we'll see in a second, is so what some would even say today, so woke, so crazy woke, no way. That's why he's a great model. I I, I very much like this, this Pope as well. Um, he was born in 1835. So at the time of the Messina earthquake, he's already an older man. He's what, you know, 73. Um, second son of 10 children. Uh, the young boy, his name is Giuseppe Sarto, walked 3.7 miles to attend school every day. And it says, therefore, invented the American parable of I'm the grandfather, walked uphill both ways, 10 miles in snow. Uh, in 1850, he was given a scholarship to attend the seminary in Padua, uh, Pope Leo XIII, whom he succeeds, makes him a cardinal in 1893. And uh, the highlights of his reign, exactly, exactly, in 1907, right? In 1907, he has this um, encyclical, Pascendi Dominici Gregoris, Feeding the Lord's Flock, 1907, which is his rejection, his owning, his poning of modernism. He famously calls modernism, 1907, quote, the synthesis of all heresies. He's like, modernism is just taking every possible, imagine every heresy about like human relations, economics, politics, just combine them into one thing, modernism. It becomes this kind of like half looked, baked over, you know, microwaved relativistic slop. Just like basically do whatever you want, man. Whatever floats your boat, like 60s, you know, you do you, you do me, I gotta be free kind of attitude. He's like, this is the synthesis of all heresies. This is anathema to any type of clear Catholic catechesis as we need it. So his 1907 encyclical, makes Americans big mad, large triggered, because a lot of Americans uh, who've already been condemned in 1899 for their, quote, Americanism by Leo XIII are basically, how dare you, how dare you, you know, how dare you condemn modernism, get with the times. And he's like, I am with the times. It's just the time is AD 100. And they're like, no, we want you to be, we want you to be now. He also very famously flips out justifiably at the French because the French in 1905, he's Pope from 1903 to 1914. The French in 1905 have their scandalous laicity law. Up to that point, laicity just means like strict state-enforced secularism. Up until 1905, even uh, the French, who are at that point, 100 years post-revolution, would sign legal documents in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. You'd have crucifixes in courtrooms. And the French, you know, make that all, you know, no, 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 we're just totally secular. And it's like, Epic fail. A lot of people have said the reason the French Revolution happened, some Catholic scholars have said this, is that the famous Sun King, Le Tate Moi, you know, the state is me, Louis XIV, that he refuses to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart. Mm -hmm. Apparently, St. Mary Margaret Alacoy of the Sacred Heart Devotion. It's a beautiful devotion. If you haven't, if you don't do the litany, litany of the Sacred Heart, it's worth doing. It's a beautiful litany, which include the divine praises um, at the end. Apparently, St. Margaret, uh, Mary Margaret Alacoy told Louis, hey, Christ wants you to put the sacred heart on the French flag. I think, right? And of course I'm being like, duh, if Christ tells you to do it, you should probably do it. And Louis is like, no. And so a hundred years later, fine. Like you, if you won't have Christ for your king, you'll have other kings. You'll have off with your head guillotine history. You guys choose that. So France, Pius also fights that, that, that constant. France is both the eldest daughter of the church. She's also the most rebellious, you know, 16 year old teenage daughter. You can't tell me what to do, dad. You know, <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna wear this. I'm gonna take the keys. I'm I, yeah, I'm gonna go see Mark again. That's a France, you know. So uh he's kind of you know fighting the French, the Americans, everyone. And he dies, he says, heartbroken in 1914, August, with the outbreak of the First World War, which he saw as kind of suicide of Europe. That's how based he is, like rooted, right? But here's how woke he is. When this happens, he fills the entire apostolic palace with refugees. Today, right, in our stupid, disgusting culture wars, we're like, Pius X was a bigot, you know? He was he condemned America. He probably hated refugees. Oh, he hated refugees? He literally opened the Vatican and said, you guys can come here. I will wash your feet. I will, you know, he's such a Christ-like figure. I love Pius X as a vicar of Christ because he represents both Christ's majesty and kingship 
The Pope should be very high. He's representing the King of Kings. When Christ comes in his glory, he's not going to come as the baby in the stable. That already happens. He's going to come as the King of Kings, right? So, so he has this height, this dignity of the office. But also, Christ did, you know, wash his disciples' feet. When time called for it, and people were suffering, he's like, you can have my house. You guys can have my bed. You guys, like, the whole thing's open to you, right? And again, to, to be specific with facts, I'm not saying he literally slept elsewhere. I don't know if he went that far. But I'm saying, but he opens up the Vatican. He's like, I don't care how long do I have to stay here. Everyone can come in, all the refugees. I'm not just going to talk a good game and say like, oh, yeah, I care for refugees and love your neighbor. But hey, why don't you guys relocate somewhere else and get these people out of here? You know, no, no. This guy is so free. You have, you know, if you haven't, if you can't tell, I like Pius X a lot. Um, but it's like, really, like, I, I love people that walk the walk. I love people that, I first of all, I love beauty. I love grandeur. I love dignity. I think our culture is so dispensed with that. Oh, this woman, she got her hair done. She's vain. What, she looked like garbage? That's the other option? She looked terrible and not care about her appearance? Like, no, like, you should take care of yourself. The Pope should present grandeur, I think. He should exude Christ's kingship power. If I meet the Pope, I should be in awe. I shouldn't be like, oh, this guy's my bro. He's my homie. He's my dog. It shouldn't be like that. It should be like, this guy's, this guy's terrifying. And there's an awe-inspiring thing. And, I, and Christ's terror, that fear of God, which is the beginning of all wisdom, as scripture says, should be a million times more horrifying. That's how Christ is described in the first chapter of Revelation, with like white wool hair and a sword coming out of his mouth. It's horrifying. Like Christ's beauty and, and dignity is awe-inspiring and, and horrifying. Horrifying in the, the, the most beautiful way, like awesomely beautiful. So Pius is this style of Pope. And yet he's also the humblest. He's like, I, yeah, like Christ, who did not disdain the virgin's womb and was born you know, amongst animals and stuff in a barn. When it comes time for people just straggling with rags, he's like, come inside. He's not calling the Red Cross to relocate them 100 miles away because I don't want to see these poor people around me. I'm too, no, he's having them come into his place. Absolutely epic, absolutely boss, absolutely great. A final person uh, to talk about, ladies and gentlemen, is where is this guy? My page numbers are all, are all mixed up. Mm. Here it is. Um, Anibale Maria di, Fran di Francia. Um, by the way, Anibale, Anibal, what, what is that name? That is Italian version of what name? This is so boss. I want, I wish, I wish it was my name. Hannibal. Hannibal, the Carthaginian general who took el elephants over the Alps. What an absolute, and he live streamed it too, which is cool. Uh, <laughs> that was the cool thing. It's one thing, it's one thing to take, uh, when you're during the second Punic War, to take elephants over the Alps. Another thing to have, he had it on Facebook Live. <laughs> there was a brief uh, historical meme thread where people were using the AI generators and so things like self handle taking a selfie of him crossing the <laughs> That's so or Genghis Khan taking a <laughs> selfie of him. Intelligent See that 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 kind of stuff like the the AI with Hannibal like that's like I hate AI I hate Jat GPT so much. Um, but that that is like less funny. Like I yeah exactly I would love to see like you know Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon and like putting on Instagram. Well, it's it's, it's funny. It's usually like a poorly rendered background with like an historical figure <laughs> making a face like a teenage girl taking a picture of a. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. It's perfect. And it's, that is, that is that's hilarious because it's such a troll on our culture. Exactly. Like I, I, the teenage girl, think people care that oh my breakfast is so amazing. Like, how dumb are we that we're like I have to photo everything I eat and do and nobody cares? Believe me, I know about no one cares. My maple syrup is your channel averages like one view per upload. I understand about people not caring about social media. Um, but right, you know, it's kind of it's kind of self-obsessed narcissist. By the way. Not to get, we're almost done. We'll talk. I really want to talk about the pious thing. I'm, I'm glad we really mentioned that. How boss pious tenth. So we're gonna talk about him next class with the First World War. Not next class. The immediate class after. And if he had, if he had an opinion on the Titanic, well, then we will talk about next class. I'm still preparing that lecture, which, by the way, is going to be. I want all of you today. Imagine I'm some kind of sleazy businessman. <laughs> imagine right now. All right, Spokane. Well, all of you came out today to learn how to sell real estate. I challenge you, I challenge you by next time in this room in a week to come back with 10 friends each, because this is a pyramid scheme. It really is a pyramid scheme. I just want to make money. So bring 10, imagine that, bring 10 people next class from Titanic. Vivian, if you don't bring 40 people next class, I'm going to be so angry. You don't even understand. Uh, 
try to get like try to get a bunch of people. Mauricio, can you like Mauricio? You are if I anything you say to me. The first time I met you, I was like, this guy's a legend, right? Like you could sell anything. Go use your your just your interpersonal skills and be like make up lies about next class if people are yeah. come. Just you tell them. It's gonna be a concert, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Tell them like. I would love that. And I would like to shame. I would be like this free food. It's catered. It's really good. Because I'm like, shame on you. Shame on you for only coming for the food. I mean, there's no food. You just, want the you just get out. Yeah, exactly. No, what? No, actually, I'm leaving the door open. You can leave. You only came for the food. How dare you? Yeah. Um. All right. The The last thing. Uh, Wait, what did Hannibal do? What did Hannibal do? Hannibal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is the last point I want to talk about this, this, this uh, saint. Annabelle Maria de Francia, de, de Francia was this priest. Um, it started in 1882. So just a really cool, really cool guy. In 1882, he started orphanages called the Anth Anth Antonian Orphanages, named after St. Anthony of Padua, which kind of like St. John Bosco had this kind of ministry helping um, young boys. It was to help orphans um, as what is more from scripture there, right, than to care for the widow and the orphan, going back to the Old Testament, right? Um, his concern was not only to provide the children with food and occupation, but above all, to assure they were brought up in a way that was integrating moral and religious principles, etc. Um, in a petition to our man, Pius X, Father Anabali says this, From my early youth, I have committed myself to that holy word of the gospel, Rogate Ergo. From my small institutes and unceasing daily prayers raised by the orphans, the poor, the priests, and the consecrated virgins, to the most sacred hearts of Jesus and Mary, to St. Joseph and the Apostles, that they may abundantly provide the church with holy and chosen priests and with evangelical workers for the spiritual harvest of souls. Um, okay, and this is wonderful. And he has a beautiful quote here, which really moved me of like, I have two sons. I have a 10-year-old and a six-year-old. I'm always thinking like, gosh, they are the apple, the apples of my eye. How do you put that? Whatever, you know, plural. I love them both so much. But as of anyone who's a father and parents, like, yeah, kids are frustrating, right? It's like the kind of obvious point. Um, being a, being a parent is the greatest blessing in the world. So you're like, dang it. I just want to go sit, like lock myself in a janitor's closet and drink a six pack, you know, um, there's this, there's this novel, this guy who just locks himself in the closet and he has a family of like, it's like a Mormon novel. I don't know how I even started reading this, but he locks himself in a closet and his like wife is like, just like, you know, it's just amazing. Um, and you're like, wait, he does this. So I guess it's not Mormon guys. I don't know. Maybe it wasn't Mormon. Okay, maybe he was a Mormon. Maybe he was having such a rough day that he was like, today I go to school Sam Adams. You know, I don't know. Maybe he's like, my name is Jack Smith. Today it's Jack Daniels. You know, I don't know. I don't know what's going on in his life. Anyways, um, what is the point of, here's the quote that was so moving. Um, and the point I was making before, wow, huge rabbit hole was, this is true. This would be a great thing for all fathers to remember in their fatherhood towards their kids. Quote, we should love children with tender and fatherly love. This is the secret of secrets to gain them to God. And of course, that, that latter part was the thing that really struck me, that a father should love his kids with a fatherly love, duh, and a mother should be tender. Like, of course, but the secret of secrets, and I, I believe that. I will personally give a shout out to my father. My father is my personal hero. I love my dad in the full fourth commandment way. Like I respect him. It's like, oh, he's, you know, my, my bro. No, like full respect. But my father, when, when my brother and I have grown up, like, showed us so much love. I owe all of the devoutness I have in my faith, I think to him in that I agree, this sounds very Freudian, but I agree that as a person, you associate God with your father. If your father is terrible and awful, you think God, the father, you know, yeah, right. I, I know, I know from a small father. So if there's some heavenly father cares for me. I know all dads, you know, abandon us, whatever. When you have an experience like, like I, you know, thank God when my father is such a holy, amazing example and cool, it makes me think, well, how much greater is God the Father? So I think Father Annabelle is exactly right. That a father who, who loves their kids purely and beautifully, well, that's the best way to have your kids maintain the faith. Not yell at them to attend Sunday school or don't don't use that dirty language or this kind of, all those kind of things. It's necessary too, but it's above all the love. And this priest embodied this. And what is the ultimate point is I dropped the paper to close the class that in the Catholic reactions, when this terrible hur not hurricane, earthquake of Messina happens, and everyone's being kind of buried alive. And there's the reaction of people that are, that are penitents. They're, they're doing you know, penance out of this. And you have Pope Pius, who's welcoming people into the apostolic palace. And to be fair, it's, it's not just the Catholic people. Secular authorities as well are responding. At this point, Italy has been a republic since 1871. Amidst all that, this is another guy doing that. His Antonian orphanages, they're normally for 
neglected boys who have, don't have a father becomes open to all these refugees as well. So the Catholic Church writ large in Messina, God, you know, making grace abound where sin abounds, making grace abound all the more. Out of this tragedy, there's a lot of beautiful responses of true corporal works of mercy. I was hungry, gave me food, thirsty, gave me drink, you know, naked, you clothed me, um, sheltering the homeless, etc. It's kind of like acts of brotherly love out of love for God. So on that note, I'm done. Does anyone else have anything else they want to say? Besides all the people you're going to bring for Titanic next class. <laughs> Is Kate Winslet? No, here's what you say. I got it. Kate Winslet will be here next class. <laughs> That's what you tell people. The woman who played Rose. She's going to be here next class. Her and I go way back. Ooh. Kate Winslet will be here. Just tell people that. It is, of course, a lie, but just people will come for that probably. Vivian, I really like your idea. Just tell them free food and Kate Winslet. And say, say if you eat enough, Kate Winslet will get Leo DiCaprio on Zoom. She'll call him. She'll see if we're See you later. <laughs>